Let's uh, pray and ask God to give us some help in his word this morning. So Father, we thank you for this powerful, powerful word. Uh, We thank you uh, that it restores our soul, rejoices our heart, makes us wise and gives light to our eyes. Would you let it do all those things this morning? Would you let us feel your affection this morning as we open our hearts up to your uh, word? Would you speak to each of us personally? Exalt the Son of God in our hearts, we pray. And we pray in his name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, Tell you a story. In 1958, I was 10 years old. That that means I'm 70 now. Just save you the uh, mathematical uh, calculations there. I was 10 years old. My mom and my dad were in the kitchen. And uh, I overheard my mom say to my dad that she, she wanted to go see the movie Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. You ever heard of that movie? Yeah, so it's uh, Elizabeth Taylor, Paul Newman, came out in 1958. So I heard that, and uh, I walked into the kitchen, and I said, uh, I want to see Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. My mom looked at me, and she said, no son of mine will ever see a movie like that. 1958, 60 years ago. And that birthed a lust in my heart to see Cat on a hot tin roof. Uh, the problem was, I lived in 1958, so we don't have cable, we don't have DVRs, and, you know, and once the movie's gone, it's gone. And uh, it, I had to wait 11 years to see Cat on a hot tin roof. I was 21 years old, came on, I, I was in college, had a final the next day, and it came on at one o'clock in the, uh, uh, in the morning on one of those late channels, I go, I'm staying up and watching Cat on a hot tin roof. It was such a disappointment. (laughs) There was no nudity, no sex scenes, hardly any profanity. And I just said, what is the big deal with Cat on a Hot Tin Roof? Now, 60 years later, I know what the big deal is. 60 years later, I pray for the sweetest Christian teenage girls who are trapped in a world of phone sex and porn. 60 years later. I have, uh, in my church in Fort Worth, elementary school teachers told me about catching first graders in the restroom in in sex acts. Um, One out of three little girls in our country is sexually abused. Hardcore porn, just to click away. Uh, A few years ago, I was looking up a... um, uh, uh, an illustration I wanted to see uh, Picasso's boy with a pipe. It was a famous painting he did. And so I, I put Google Picasso boy with a pipe, uh, hit the uh, a whole bunch, bunch of things came up, hit one, and it was a calendar of nudes. I mean, you could tell what it was. It, you, you had to click in it for it to actually open up. Now, I, I wasn't looking for porn. I, I was just I was looking for a painting by Picasso. See, 60 years before that, my non-Christian, unchurched mom who cussed like a sailor said, no son of mine will ever see a movie like that. Any of you my age, you remember what those days were like? 60 years ago, what our culture was like? It's completely changed. We live now in a culture of sexual insanity. And this shouldn't surprise us. This, this, was actually, uh, this was actually prophesied in the Bible. Turn to Revelation 17, 1 and 2. John actually saw all this in the first century. Revelation 17, verses 1 and 2. One of the seven angels who had seven bowls, who had the seven bowls, said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth, that's all the influential uh, people on the earth, have committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. 
Now, people debate what the great prostitute is, a city of Babylon or something else, but what's obvious is the spirit energizing the great prostitute. There is a demonic general who has a whole army of unclean spirits, and their purpose is to make the world drunk with sexual insanity. And that's actually happened now. We're actually living uh, in that time. 60 years ago, who would have thought? Now, it's a whole different, whole different time. In fact, it's gonna get worse. Look at uh, chapter nine, verse 20 in Revelation. Chapter nine, verse 20. Here's what, here's what the last days are gonna look like. The rest of mankind that were not, this is verse 20, the rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols they cannot see, hear, or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Sexual insanity Murder, that is going to be the norm in, in our uh, culture. That is where we're, we're uh, headed. I didn't grow up in a world of drive-by shootings, but I live in one now. Did you know we have the honor of living in the city that has more murders per capita than any other city in our, in our country? I mean, drive-by shootings, killing somebody for the sake of killing somebody 60 years ago? Who thought like that? That it just wasn't here. And it's just, and what happened is this insanity is going to get worse and worse and worse. So, I asked myself, I go, why is the devil so concerned to make us a sexually drunk culture? What, what benefit accrues to him for doing that? And obviously, um, marriages and families are weakened, children are traumatized, but there's a deeper, better benefit for him. Sexually shamed people sexually shamed Christians have the hardest time praying. Before, uh, before I was married, there was, a, there was a period of time where I, I struggled, really struggled with sexual immorality. And I can tell you what, it, it was one of the hardest times in my life to pray. This voice was just, you hypocrite. I just, if you were really serious about God, God doesn't answer prayers of people like you. So if he can defile us, he can keep us from praying. And that's the most important thing to him is keeping the church of the Lord Jesus Christ from praying because God governs the world through the prayers of his saints. You know what the Son of God is doing right now? He tells us in the Word. Hebrews 7 says he is living. He always lives to make intercession for us. He's praying for you and me by name right now. The Holy Spirit, what's he doing? Romans 8 uh, 26, 27, he's praying and groanings that can't be uttered by humans and, and praying for things we don't even know we need, but they're critical. God the Son, God the Spirit are praying. <laughs> so what's the message? I want my church to pray because I govern the world by the prayers of the saints. And the devil sees that and, and he had, he's doing everything he can to stop us. So the devil was in heaven. He had a time where he was in heaven. He saw the glory of God, and he saw how much God loves his children. And the devil doesn't understand love. To, to him, in the devil's eyes, we're just pathetic, weak combinations of spirit and flesh. And why God would even be interested in this, he doesn't have a clue, but he sees the love. He was there at the cross, I and mean, he, he summoned all of hell to gather around the cross and taunt the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw the infinite pain. He was in the spirit world. He saw the infinite pain that God the Son endured to save us. I mean, he knows, he knows how much God loves us, and he saw what happened to that thief on the cross beside Jesus. This was a person... That, he had, that the devil had had in his power for years and years and years, all of that man's adult life, he was, he was held right in the hand of Satan. And now the man is on a cross. He's just a few hours away from death where Satan can feast on his misery for all eternity. And he can taste him. And then that man turns to Jesus and utters a one-sentence prayer. A man who wasted his life causing pain to other people. 
A man who can't get baptized, can't join the church, can't give money, can't make wrong things right, he did. A, 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 a man on his way to hell, and he turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. <laughs> One sentence prayer. Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Your soul's not gonna sleep someplace for a thousand years in unconsciousness. Today, when you close your eyes in death, you're gonna open them and see my face smiling at you, and you're gonna be with me happy forever in paradise. The devil saw that. He saw once the power of a one-sentence prayer of a man who wasted his life being put to death on the cross, and all of a sudden, he snatched right out of the devil's hand. He saw all that at the cross, and he thinks, Man, if these people ever wake up and ever realize how much they're loved and how much God longs to answer their prayers and they start praying together, my empire of hate is doomed. And so what's his main strategy? It's to keep us from praying. That's what he works at. Um, he'll defile us. He'll do anything he can to keep us from praying. And the truth is, if we were to look at the church, at least in the Western world, He's been pretty effective in suppressing the prayers of believers. Uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, prayer. You mean it's come to that? It's kind of like the last alternative, right? Um, that's the bad news. Now, here's the good news. It is all about to change. This is in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 12. That's what we're going to look at uh, now. Um, there are two sections to this, and I'll give you a little clue about how John writes. John will tell a story in Revelation and then he will put a hymn after it and the hymn actually interprets the story. So if you, if you brought your Bibles here, you can, you can see verses seven to nine. They're just written like a normal narrative story. But then look at all the indentation in the verses that follow, 10 to 12. It's, it's poetry in Greek. So he's, he's, he's composed a hymn and the hymn is actually interpreting the story. So let's read the story, see what happens there. And there was war in heaven. Michael and the angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. You know that the devil has access to heaven now. He doesn't live there, but he has access there. So, uh, Daniel gets this vision, doesn't understand it, starts fasting, prays, God, please show me what this means. And three weeks later, an angel comes to him to explain the vision. And he said, Daniel... You are highly esteemed in heaven. The very day you prayed, God sent me to, give, to answer you, but I have been withstood by the, the demon, the prince of Persia, the demon that's over uh, Persia. I've, I had to battle him for three weeks, and Michael the archangel came and helped me, and that's why it took me so long to get here. The devil has a access to, to heaven. Oh, and when, when uh, Jesus came, re re religious leaders didn't have a clue who he was, right? But every demon in hell knew who he was. Son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time? They knew exactly who he was. So they have access to this information that's hidden from us. So there's a war. So, so there's a war in heaven. And verse 8 says, But he, the dragon, the devil, was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. You think, what does he lose? Well, he can't interfere with the, the good angels and their, uh, their ministry to the believers. That's, that's what the angels are, do now. They're, they serve us. And now that, that heavenly interference has been removed. All of the spying ability that the, the devil had from, in, in heaven. He's lost all that. Now he's on the earth. But he's lost something much, much worse. Um, now the hymn is going to tell us what that is he's lost. Then I heard heaven, excuse me, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. John's up there and he hears, he hears this voice. And, and it's, like, uh, it's, it's like the voice is saying, John, you, you, saw, you saw Jesus raise Lazarus. You, you saw him walk on the water. You saw him feed the 5,000. Uh, you saw him come up out of the tomb. But you haven't seen anything yet. Now, on the earth, 
have come, the salvation, the power, the kingdom, and the authority of his Christ. The greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit is coming in the last days. And it's coming in the middle of the worst evil released on the earth. We, Revelation says in, in, those, in chapter seven, in those three and a half years of the great tribulation, so many people from all over the world, every language, they come to the Lord, they're martyred for their faith, and now they're in heaven, uh, in heaven praying, and, and John says, no one could count them. There were so many. <laughs> We've had some great periods of evangel evangelization, but nothing like what's coming. There is a salvation coming that's gonna, that is, is going to swell the kingdom of heaven. There is a salvation, a deliverance from sin, from addiction, from disease that is coming like we have never, ever seen before. There are two prophets that God's going to raise up in Revelation 11, and they will be able to strike the earth with every plague they want, whenever they want. And if anybody tries to hurt them, fire comes out of their mouths and destroys them. I don't think it means they're actually fire breathing. I think it's like uh, Elisha when he prayed uh, and fire came out of heaven and destroyed the enemies. I think it's like that. God will have such protection around them. It's all on the way. <laughs> Unprecedented salvation. Unprecedented power over demons, over getting rid of them, over uh, uh, just the ability to bring so many people clean and free. And then he says, and the kingdom. He goes, finally, the kingdom has come to the earth. You know that prayer we've been praying for 2,000 years? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know that prayer? Answers. There's coming a body of Christ on the earth that will do his will on earth like it's done in heaven. That's actually come. God is gonna honor that prayer in an unprecedented way. The authority of Christ is coming in a way we've never seen. The exaltation of Christ on the earth is gonna be so great that the power brokers, the power brokers, the evil power brokers of the world are gonna cry out to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne. <laughs> we, it really is gonna be revelation, an unveiling of the glory and the power of the Son of God. That time is really coming and it starts with the hurling of the devil out of heaven. Now, now he says, well, what is now? I mean, well, what's changed in the last 2,000 years to release all this power? And he tells us. He, he says, for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God night and day. He's been hurled down. What does that mean, he accuses Christians night and day before God? Does it mean that devil... Or, or he used to be able to do this before he got cast out of heaven. He, he would stand up before God and he'd go, hey, look at Jack now. <laughs> you call him your son, but look what he's doing. Does it mean that? He's just up there pointing out my sins to God? Well, that would have no effect on God and would have none on me because I wouldn't, I'd be oblivious to it. It can't mean that. Here's what it means. It means night or day when we go to God in prayer, he accuses us. Have you ever wondered why, when we try to ask God for something really big, we start thinking about our sins? Am, am I telling the truth here? Yeah. Huh. yeah we, we ask God for healing. We ask God to bring our son back, our daughter back, our husband back, our wife back. We ask God for something that's really important to us, and a voice says, well, yeah, God's doing that for some people, just not people like you. He does it for people who are consistent who are mature, who walk with them, but not people like you. And then we start thinking about some of our sins. I stand on a stage uh, all the time, some conference, and I'm, just as I'm getting ready to pray for people, I'm asking God, show me people here you want to heal, show me what to pray for. And this voice comes and says, <laughs> yeah, God does heal, but you know what? You should have fasted. You didn't fast. You're not, I mean, you should have put a lot more effort into this. You should have prayed about this meeting a lot more. And the truth is, I never pray about anything enough. Do you? Do you ever pray about anything enough? No. Yeah. In fact, what happens if we're really moving toward God, the, uh, the closer we get to God, 
the more aware we become of our distance from God. Aware of distance. I didn't say we get further away. The closer we get to the light, the more dirt we see in our, in our life. And you say, well, how can you look at all that? Because the closer I get to God, the more of his affection I feel. And I know that the dirt in my life does not hinder that affection at all. But his accusing ministry is super successful. It's super successful. Causes us to stop praying uh, or weakens our prayers. Or, oh, and, and then when we join in and we go, you know, and there are other church down there and, and, and we start accusing one another. You know that's what's standing in the way of the release of the greatest power the earth will ever see? It's not our lack of holiness. It's our agreement with the accusing ministry of Satan. You ever thought about that? And the good news is that there is coming a generation, maybe, I hope, maybe we're the first of it. There's coming a generation that is going to resist the accusing ministry of Jesus. You say, well, how do they do that? It says in verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. There's coming a time, there's coming an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that when we stretch our hands out to heaven and we say, God, would you please do this? And we're asking for some miracle. And, and this voice comes and says, yeah, but he, he, he does miracles, just not for people like you. So the whole purpose of that voice is to get us to believe God's goodness is contingent on our goodness. And if we believe that, it's really gonna, it's gonna be difficult to pray for anything with faith or power. That's the whole purpose of it. But there's coming a time when we're asking God for a miracle and that voice is going to say, yeah, not for people like you. Go, and we're going to go, no, I am a blood-bought child of the living God. I can go into, into the throne room and stand right before the Son of God by the blood of Jesus. It's not my holiness. It's the blood of Jesus. <laughs> there is coming a time when God is going to pour out confidence in the blood of his Son. And we are going to pray like never before. And we're going to overcome the accuser. He's going to lose <laughs> his most valuable weapon. Now, there's one other thing to, uh, that, that we need to know. Uh, I got to have confidence in the power of the blood of Jesus. But there's something else I got to have. I have to feel loved. I'm not going to pray long or hard if I feel like God's irritated with me. Or if I feel like he's waiting to change me. That's what the devil wants. Say, yeah, yeah, God will do this, but you've got to change first. You've got to clean yourself up first. He's just waiting for me to change. As long as I do not feel loved, it will be really hard to pray with power. I, uh, as a young life leader, I, I heard this for 10 years. I'm talking to a young guy, and a guy, we'd be talking about family issues and problems, and a, and a teenager would look at me, and he would say, eyes would start going down. He would say, I know my father loves me. And I'm thinking, if that's true, why are you so sad when you say that sentence? He's got a theoretical belief in his father's love. In fact, to think your father didn't love you, man, what would that say about me? You know? And so he's got a theoretical belief, but not much experience of it. See, I see this all over the church today. Uh, and I know what it's like to feel that way. I know what it's like to uh, have a theoretical belief in his love, but so little experience of it. See, we, we people who are married, right, we want an experience of our, of our spouse's love. We, we don't want someone saying, well, you know, I told you 20 years ago when we got married, I love you. That's still in force till I reject it. <laughs> or it's in print. We, we want something more than in print. We want some kind of tangible demonstration of the affection that our spouse has for us. Why would it be different with God? There's a huge difference between believing God loves me and actually feeling his love. So I want to give you, just take a, a little digression here. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter three, and I want to give you one of the greatest prayers. If you're not praying it every day, you got to start. And yeah, this is my daily go-to prayer. I want to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor as myself. I want to do that, hands down. That, I want that to be the dream of my life. You know, not, not, I want it to be the dream, and I want grace to fulfill that dream. But you know what? 
I will never love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength unless I first feel his affection for me. Isn't that what he says? We love God because he first loved us, right? He said, so feeling the affection of God is just like one of the major keys to life. So here's the prayer. This is an apostolic prayer inspired by the Holy Spirit. Those kind of prayers are meant to be prayed until Jesus comes back. So verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. The strength is here. There is always going to be trouble going on out here, always. There's always gonna be a war, there's always gonna be some amount of chaos going out, out here, and the mistake is to focus on the chaos out there. That's the mistake. The battle out here is won by what happens in my heart. The most important thing that can happen in my inner being is to be strengthened with the love of Jesus. Right? Okay, so here, here's the next part of the prayer. He says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. We want stability in life. We want roots that go down like those big trees where we can't be blown around. Then we have to feel the love of God. He, he, that's what he's talking about here. That you, you may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. This is not something we get to by studying and we hold up here in our mind. It's not something that comes like that. It only comes by revelation. It, it goes, the love he's talking about here goes beyond what we can know. It's something in our hearts that we feel. And it only happens by revelation. So if I, if I listen to my heart, my, my heart's going to condemn me. But when God comes into the room uh, and answers this prayer, I cry like a baby and feel the affection and feel loved. And it can happen, and it can happen regularly. There was a time in my life when I rarely felt the affection of the Lord Jesus. Now I feel it all the time. I just woke up some years ago and realized, you need to be praying for this. I woke up some years ago and realized, hey, study is great, but that's, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is pouring out your heart to God and praying. And that's when prayer became more important to me than study. And then it was just a short jump from there to, Lord, let me feel your affection, just taking this prayer and, uh, and, and praying it um, e every day to be filled with his love, to the, be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Pray it every day and pray, and pray it several times a day. Just make it, make it your go-to prayer and then see what happens and then just take notes on what happens. You're, you're in for a treat. Um, he will let us, he, he is so brilliant, so stunningly creative that he will come in to our absolute worst dejected moments with a major dose of his affection. He'll do it in the good times, he'll do it in the bad times. Happens to me all the time now uh, because I sit in a chair and ask for it to happen. I drive along the road and ask for it to happen. This is my, one of my go-to, one of my go-to prayers, one of my favorite scriptures. I'll tell you about uh, the worst time in our life and uh, what God did for us during that time. The worst time in our life was when we lost our 22-year-old son, Scott. He, he um, drugged out a day after Christmas, committed suicide in our home. And uh, I prayed for that boy more than I prayed for anyone. And I always felt, uh, felt like my first son would be a writer, but I always felt like Scott, my second born, I always felt like he'd be standing on a stage with me. Uh, he had faith, he had prophetic spirit, uh, he, he, he was a charmer. Uh, I always felt like, you know, okay, he's gonna go through this rough period, um, but I'm, God's gonna answer this prayer. And then I woke up that morning and God said a final no. And when he did, I lost my story for a living. You know, we all have a story we tell ourselves, right? It helps us get out of bed in the morning, helps us interpret life, it shows us who's a good person, who's a bad person. We all have a story we live by, but the morning uh, I lost my son, I also lost my story.
for a living. I just, I lost my, I mean, there wasn't anything I wanted to do. I just thought I should try to save my family, and then I thought, huh, you couldn't save your son, how are you gonna save your family? And so we just cratered. We couldn't spend another night in our home, we couldn't stay in our city. We lived in one of those beautiful cities in the, in the country, in Whitefish, Montana. We got, uh, took us three days to get his body on a plane with us, and, and an uh, hour after uh, we lost him, uh, my phone started ringing from all over the country, people I haven't even called. And our best friends from Fort Worth, John and Nancy Snyder, called, and they were crying. And uh, Nancy just said, Jackie, you get home right now. You will live with us, we will take care of you. And uh, so three days later, we stood in front of John and Nancy's door. Nancy opened the door, and she said, you, they had this huge, big, beautiful home. And she said, uh, you all take that side, we'll take this side, and we're just gonna grow old together. I hear people criticize the body of Christ all the time. Yeah, those people are hypocrites down at the church. Ah, oh, they just want your money. I don't believe it. <laughs> body of Christ has been my salvation. When we were at the lowest of the low, our 20 and 30 year friends sacrificed for us like you wouldn't believe. When we couldn't wash our clothes, they washed our clothes. When we couldn't cook food, they put, <laughs> fixed our food, gave us their credit cards, gave us their cars. Listened to us wail and cried with us. You, you show me a place better in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got problems, but you show me a place better than this body right here. We grasp how wide and high and deep is the love of Christ together with all the saints. It happens in the body. So, this is not a time in our lives where you'd expect God uh, to break through with some amazing display of his affection, and that's exactly what he did, just over and over. And I'll just tell you about one. Um, eight weeks after we lost my son, we were living, still living with John and Nancy, and uh, I hadn't gone to church. I didn't know if I'd ever go to church again. A guy like me, we go to church. We go to church to say something. I didn't have anything to say. I mean, I was still try, trying to figure out who God was. If, if, he lets you, if he lets your best prayer fall to the ground, I mean, why pray, right? So I'm, I'm trying to figure out if prayer even works. So eight weeks after uh, we lose Scott, this church from Amarillo, Texas, it's about 400 miles northwest uh, of Fort Worth, uh, up in the Panhandle, this is a church of about 5,000 people. It's a lot more than that now. But it was a church I went to every single month. And the, the pastor, Jimmy Evans, had a marriage and family TV ministry. And he would take off a, a week and, and not do sermon or anything and work on that ministry. And then I would go in and I would go to the elder meetings and I would, I would preach all the weekend services. And it was, it was just like being on staff there. And it was great. Um, and then we lost Scott and I didn't go up there. And about... Two months uh, after we lost Scott, they called. And they said, Jack, um, all of our senior pastors are out of town, and we've got a famous speaker coming this weekend, and there's no one who could introduce him or emcee the services. Would you ask Lisa if it's okay if you come? And if you can't, that's okay. We totally understand. But you won't even be here 24 hours, just the two Saturday services, uh, the two Sunday morning, and you'll be right back on a plane. And Lisa said, honey, go. That church has been wonderful to us. Just go. I'll be fine. I've got Elise and Stephen here. I'll be fine. So get on the plane, go up there. Do the first service Saturday afternoon. It's, it's uh, over. And I'm standing down here at the front on this side. There's 70 people on the prayer team. They're the, it's the first prayer team. And they're, they're, they're praying for people because people get healed in that church. And, uh, but I'm not praying for anybody. Um, I haven't laid these hands on anyone since I held my shattered son's head in these hands and prayed for God to give him back. And, and uh, we just said, we gathered around him and we all laid our hands on him and we said, we're going to pray for God to bring Scott back until he brings him back or the police come and make us leave. And I held his head and prayed for 30 minutes and the police came and made us leave. That's the last time I prayed for anybody. So I'm standing in the prayer team, but I'm not praying for anybody. And then I see over here a pretty blonde lady, and she's leading a person. And I, I start staring at the person. I can't figure out if it's a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, because the person has no face. 
And all of a sudden, she's leading him straight up to me. And I look at, I look at this person. I'm like, where there should have been eyes, there were just two slits here, and they were sewn, it's like they were sewn shut. What should have been a nose, I was not wrecking, just this gaggle of, yeah, it was awful. And where there should have been a mouth, there's just this misshapen hole. And then out of the throat was a permanent trach tube. So she brings him right up to me. And she says, hi, my name's Michelle. This is my son, Aaron. Uh, six months ago, Aaron was so distraught, he put a shotgun under his chin and pulled the trigger. It's taken multiple surgeries to get him to this point. And he doesn't believe in God. But he came up here because I asked him to. Would you pray for my son? My first time in church in eight weeks. Last time I put these hands on anybody, it was my son. And now I'm looking at this boy with no face. And I said, Aaron, my name's Jack. Do you want me to pray for you? Put his finger over the tube so the air would go up his vocal cords. And he said, yes. I put this hand on his back. And the second my left hand touched his heart, power from heaven rippled down my head, down my back, down my legs, and stayed on me. I didn't even have to think about what I was going to say. It was on prophetic automatic pilot. And I said, Aaron, my son pulled the trigger at Christmas, but he didn't make it. You've been spared because God has purposes for your life if you want to fulfill them. And then Michelle began to sob. She said, please, I, so I, I didn't know. Please forgive me. I, I didn't know you were the pastor who said, I'm just so sorry. I never would have done this. And I said, Michelle, stop. Don't. Don't cry. You, you've done, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. You haven't done anything wrong. This is a divine appointment between us and God. I'm happy to be here praying for your son. I finished praying for uh, Aaron. Then I turned and prayed for uh, Michelle. Had exactly the same experience of power. My first time to be back in church. I watched them walk away. As I looked at <laughs> I, I looked up to heaven and I said, I said, I said, God, you are amazing. Nobody writes stories like you. And just like that, I had my story back. I knew what he was saying. He was saying, Jack, you stay with me. Don't leave. Stay with me. And I'm going to give you power to help the hopeless. See, so he didn't take away the pain, but he at the lowest points, would break in with that kind of display of his love for, you know, this is not a mistake, revealing his affection. Um, uh, a few years later, I tried to find Aaron and Michelle, and I couldn't find them. I, and somebody said they were on Oprah, and I looked on Oprah, couldn't find it. And I found them last year in Austin, Texas. Aaron loves God, and he speaks in youth uh, groups all over the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, pray for God to reveal his affection for you. Let that be like the go to prayer. Take Ephesians, there, there are a number of passages. I just love Ephesians 3. 16 to 19. If I'm really going to pray, I not only have to put my confidence in the power of the blood of Jesus to, to, to know that's why I'm coming to his presence, not by my holiness, never going to be by my holiness, but I also, if I'm going to pray long term, I have to feel loved by him. And that's what he wants to do. He just waits, waits for us to uh, ask for it. Um, so, uh, I am so grateful that my church has a prayer room. The church of the last days is gonna, the prayer rooms are gonna be filled because what's happening here in uh, Ephesians, or excuse me, in, in Revelation 12 is that there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit to get our confidence back in the power of the blood of Jesus. And so the last day church is gonna be a praying church like never before. 
I think about 20 years ago, there was something like maybe just some small amount of churches that were, were committed to prayer. Now there's thousands and thousands of churches all over the world that are, are, have houses of prayer, prayer rooms, and are praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on their, on their cities, on the world. It's, it's really happening. We're, 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 maybe, we're, we're probably the vanguard of that group that's gonna get our confidence back in the blood of Jesus to go right into the throne room. We're gonna feel loved like never before, and, and we are going to make the request that God's gonna honor and change the world. Now, I'm gonna tell you about three little traps, three lies the devil uses to keep us out of the prayer room. I've already told you one. He tells us we're not holy, so our prayers won't make a difference, right? So I'm gonna ask you a question, but I don't want anybody answering it. How many of us are not going to the prayer room because we believe we're not holy and our prayers won't make a difference? For those of us who believe that, we've fallen into the accusing ministry of the devil. We've fallen under his ministry. Our holiness is never gonna save anyone. Our holiness is not, not what gives power to our prayers. It's our confidence in the blood of Jesus and the fact that we just show up and pray what he's told us to pray. Um, all right, second lie. He'll tell us, you know what? Now is not a convenient time. The playoffs are on this afternoon. It's not a convenient time to go. Uh, we'll always have time to pray later. So we'll always have time to pray later. And the truth is, now is the only time we can pray. Now is the only time I can express my faith. When I get to heaven, I'm, I'm not going to have faith. I'm going to have knowledge. Now is the only time I can pray. And prayer, is this what I've learned about prayer? It's never convenient. Never convenient. There's always something pressing, always something that, that begs to be done. There's always this tyranny of the urgent that if we let it, it'll crowd out prayer until we make a commitment to pray. And we make prayer the most important thing. I used to think I could pray in a car. You know, going back, I, I lived in Fort Worth, taught in, in Dallas, and so I thought, well, I'll just pray in the car on the way over. And what I've learned is when I try to make Jesus convenient, it doesn't work. And anything that's important to me has, has a pride of place in my life. Um, so now it's not convenient, probably never will be, uh, and we're not gonna have time later. So pray, what? set a time. Um, I'm gonna get up at six every morning, that's gonna be in my prayer time, from six to 6.30, six to 6.15, or it's gonna be at eight, or it's gonna be at 10 at night. Whatever is the, con whatever is the time when we're most alert, uh, most rested, because it takes energy to pray. You can't do it when you're tired. Uh, pick, pick that time out, and then pick a time to go to the prayer room. Uh, I'm going to go to the prayer room once a month. Just make a commitment, or twice a month, or, or, or once a week, whatever. Just make a commitment, and then show up at that commitment. That's how I started praying. I just said, I studied, all, I studied my head off all the time. That One day I just came to the conclusion, no, you've got to start praying. So I just set a time. I started praying. And it wasn't fun at first. I mean, sitting in a chair and telling this omniscient being what he already knows, telling him what he's told you to tell him, that is uh, weak, right? It's in, on, on some respects. I was uh, sitting in a chair a couple, a couple three years ago. Uh, I, I have a thing where I, I, I pray for a number of things, but always... Pray for my family, uh, pray for my uh, children. But it was particularly dull. Uh, I mean, really dull. So dull, in fact, that I just stopped. And uh, I, it was so dry, I just stopped. I, I looked up to heaven and I said, God, are you enjoying this? Because I'm not. <laughs> I mean, does this mean anything to you? Not a word. So I go, no. I know I'm supposed to do it, so I just go back to my dull prayer and pray. Dull, dull prayer not feeling anything. Three days later, my son calls. The one I pray for every day. He's a reporter, pray for his writing. And my son calls and said, oh dad, I just won best feature writer in the state of Missouri again. And this question just popped into my mind. Does this mean anything to you? I, stopped, I go, okay, okay. <laughs> you are amazing. Okay, I get it, it means something to you. Dry prayers, maybe they mean the most to God. I can't make myself feel, I don't, so I don't even worry with that. But maybe, that's, maybe that kind of prayer means the most to him because it's the hardest to pray during that time. 
But he showed me that it was important to him. Does this mean anything to you? I mean, that question pops right back in my uh, mind. So, uh, and then here's the last uh, trap. Um, you gotta start somewhere, you gotta start with the commitment. All right, so here's what the devil has said to me about praying for the kingdom. The kingdom is gonna come whether you pray for it or not. I, I never, that uh, your will be done on earth, uh, your, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Uh, you know, why pray that? Because it's gonna happen, right? It's, it's gonna happen anyway, so why should I pray it? I was talking to the Lord about that one day. I just don't get this. And, and oh, that's another thing I do. I ask the Lord questions. And it's like he said to me, Jack, it is gonna come whether you pray or not. But if you pray, you'll have a role in bringing my kingdom into the earth and you'll give me bragging rights over you. So what our father wants to do is he wants to brag over us. That's the whole doctrine of rewards in the New Testament. There's just tons of passages, but the essence of the reward is standing before heaven and having Jesus brag on you before all of heaven. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That word will stay over a faithful Christian's life their whole time in heaven. Everyone in heaven will see the glory of the approval of the Son of God resting on that person. And here's the thing. Every second we're in heaven, our impression of the beauty, the majesty, the greatness of God grows, and so that reward grows. The, the nature, the majesty of that reward grows. And wise people are living for that day. So yeah, kingdom's gonna come whether I pray for it or not. But uh, I wanna have a role in it, so I'm gonna pray, uh, pray for it. Now, Ron mentioned a, a passage last week I thought was phenomenal. I just wanna close with this. This is Luke 21, 34 to 36. Luke 21, 34 to 36. He's just finished, they're, they're up, it's the morning, they're on the Mount of Olives, it's bright, it's sunny. He just finished the story of how the world is gonna end. Theologians call it the Olivet Discourse. And he's got his A-team there, Peter and John. And, and uh, he, he looks at his A-team and then he says this to him. He says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation. Do you know what dissipation is? It's wasting our life on the pursuit of pleasure. This is the default setting of the heart, Jesus says. Be careful or you're gonna be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. He's coming back. He's coming back. The church is all going to see him. He says, he looks at Peter and he goes, Peter, you're my rock. But if you don't pray, you're going to go down to dissipation. John, you're my best friend. But if you don't pray, you're going to become a drunk. Listen, you guys. The anxieties of life are gonna take all of you down if you don't pray, so pray. He said, but what I really want is I want you to be able to stand before me when I come back. So, I know what it's like to fall to dissipation, drunkenness, and anxieties. I've been waylaid by all of those things. Um, and I don't wanna be taken out of the race anymore by by any of those, but I'm going to the prayer room this afternoon, and uh, the main reason I'm going, the absolute main reason, is that last sentence we just read. I wanna be one of the ones that can stand when the Son of God comes back. I'm 70 years old. I never thought I'd get here. <laughs> here I am. Uh, the second coming of Jesus is really close for me. I think about it every day. I've never seen the face of the Son of God, but I've heard his voice. I hear his voice a lot. 
but I've never seen his face. And now I'm just a few heartbeats away from seeing his face. And when I do, I don't want to hang my head in shame. I don't want to cringe in fear. When I stand before the Son of Man, I want to see the Son of God smile. How can you make a perfect person who has everything happy? How can you do that? I don't know. But it happens, and I want to be one of the ones that see a smile on his face. And there are only two words I want to hear Jesus say to me. Well done. That's actually the main... That's actually the main reason I'm going to the prayer room. It's part of the deal. I want to be able to live forever with the honor of having made my Savior happy. Let's pray. Oh God, would you grant to us an impartation of the Holy Spirit to come before you every day, opening up our hearts to bringing that great revelatory prayer from Ephesians 3, 16 to 19, to pray every day, to feel your affection. And would you break through all the lies and all the doubt and the self-condemnation we have, would you break through all of that, just cut through it with your revelatory power and let us feel your affection on a regular basis. And Lord, would you give us joy in the prayer room, joy in your house of prayer. I pray now, break the power of accusation over all of us. Give us confidence in the power of the blood of the Son of God so that we come uh, with our heads up into the throne room. Our heads up and our hearts rejoicing. Pour out your spirit on Grace Church in an unparalleled way. Pour out your spirit on the churches in St. Louis. We say with the first century church, now Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through your, through your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Would you do that for us, Lord? Do that for us, for your church in St. Louis, for your church in our country, for your church in the world. Pour out your spirit now. 